For about 10 years, we've heard about what the impact of producing different foods across the supply chain are. Things like how the production of meat compares to the growing of peas to provide protein, the land use, the farm, animal feed, processing, transportation, retail, and packaging, the entire thing. It's the ability to measure all the impacts on our greenhouse gas emissions that matter. We also have heard that the benchmark should be a rise in global temperature of no more than one and a half degrees Celsius. What we haven't heard is the impact of people and how different income groups need to change, change their ways to get to their carbon fair share. Vox has a brilliant column that explores this and identifies what individuals must do in order for us to meet the goal of an equitable and fair low carbon lifestyle. That allocation has to be in place by 2030. And remember, that's just nine years away from what many scientists and environmentalists are saying we must do. Otherwise, the planet and human life are in for some real issues. Global income must always come with a caveat that the cost of living in different countries varies. So what a dollar buys here in Los Angeles may be quite different than from what a dollar equivalent buys in Beijing, China. So I'm just going to share these numbers to give you a wake up call so that you can dig into this further. The top line is that the world's wealthiest people, the top 1%, cause double the carbon burden than the poorest that 1% equates to 70 million people versus the poorest, which represent 3.5 billion, half the world's population. According to 2015 figures in equivalent U.S. dollars, the top one represent those making $109,000 and more. The bottom 50% make less than $6,000 a year. To reach the U.N. emissions gap report goals, that top 1% needs to cut 97%, that's 97% of their carbon use to achieve their fair share. The poorest, well, they can actually increase their carbon footprint by 300%. The middle bracket, which includes the top 10%, which is measured by those making more than $38,000 a year, they too have a daunting task to reduce their use by 91%. So the question is, how do we tell that top 10% yet alone the 1%, that they have to give up their rights of passage to being higher wage earners, to give up that second car, or go to a more efficient electric vehicle, or to use public transportation, to eat less red meat and more plant protein. A 2020 Nature Communications paper titled Scientists Warning on Affluence underscores the importance that any move towards sustainability will only be effective if far-reaching lifestyle changes complement those technological advancements. The United Nations report calls for a reframing of the meaning of affluence, away from intensive resource use towards what they say is the advancement of well-being and the quality of life. The UN also report that 70% of total global emissions emanate directly from personal decisions like diet, and transportation. They point out that 30% of global greenhouse gases come from our food supply. And just one plane ride from New York to Los Angeles burns up 90% of an annual fair share. Many of our shoppers have learned during the pandemic how to live a lower impact lifestyle. And our food supply wasting less, eating more at home, eating more plant-based foods. With our jobs, working from home and not driving as much. Those lessons that we learned, we should maintain long after the pandemic is over if we want to reach these UN climate goals.